We talking about talking. Here we go. Uh. Ah, he said he living life as a gringo. Where you question, where you fit, and every time you mingle, they say you do this with not enough that. My rapping is really bad. <laughs> this life as a gringo. Yes, hello and welcome to another episode of Life as a Gringo. I am Dramos, of course, and it is Thursday, so it means time for our Thursday Trends episode. I'm flying solo on today's show, but I wanted to hop into a couple things that I've been following along, a couple stories I've been following along, uh, one of which is the Latino vote, which almost feels weird <sighs> saying out loud it's it's like a double-edged sword we'll we'll get into why but we're gonna talk about that and a really interesting book uh from an author named paula ramos who actually writes about conservative latinos specifically those who have gone to the far right you know the the maga loving latinos um and all this amidst Vice President Harris uh, having a town hall that was organized by Univision for the idea of trying to cultivate the Latino vote. So we'll talk about that. We will touch on uh, Puerto Rico, who just got some funding for uh, a new solar project on the island. I've, I've mentioned a bunch that there's a lot of issues with the power grid over there and people um living with consistent blackouts um so we will talk about that uh, on a positive side of things or this one's kind of controversial i guess depending on what side of of the fence you fall on with this i'm viewing it as a positive i'm open to hearing other people's arguments or counter arguments and we'll mention a couple here but uh siete foods just got acquired for a buttload of money siete foods is a uh they are a mexican american owned uh brand and Pepsi just acquired them. So we will talk a bit about that. And if you're watching the video version of the show on the Michael Thoreau Podcast YouTube, I am decked out in full-on winter attire right now. I got the beanie going on. I got the hoodie. I got the bomber jacket. It is it is cold, y'all. And even though I've grown up in this area my entire life, I think I've been spending too much time in Puerto Rico because it's just hitting me different this year, I feel like. I, I don't know. It's, it's cold. Just as, as an aside, shout out to all my people in the the cold struggle out here. We are in this together. I feel like fall just skipped us. Uh, you know the cute little like sweater outfits for fall, gone. We got to put a jacket on now. It's winter's here. Anyway, let's talk about the nonsense, the BS, as we always do in a segment we call for the people in the back. Say a lot for the people in the back. Let's start with the elusive Latino vote. Now, we are mere weeks away from the presidential election, November 5th. Crazy. I already voted early. Got that mail-in ballot done. Uh, and Vice President Harris and Donald Trump both been on the campaign trail doing their uh, different rallies or events or press interviews and different things. Uh, Vice President Harris recently sat down with Charlemagne the God. Um, uh, from the breakfast club and they did a, a, a town hall. Um, there's that one was to, you know, reach, um, potential black voters. She also did now one with, uh, Univision, a town hall fielding questions from Latino voters. There's been a lot of conversation around the Latino vote. There's also been an uptick in support for Donald Trump from Latinos, uh, particularly uh, young men uh, in general. And yeah, it's interesting conversations. And I, and I always say like the idea of the Latino vote is it's like a double-edged sword of a, of a phrasing because, you know, I'm all about a unified Latino community regardless of our background, you know, particularly those who are, are, Latino American, you know, I feel like we kind of are fighting the same fight here um, in, in the States collectively. But also, it is a bit dangerous when you try and just like encapsulate a very diverse group of people with a very diverse group of needs onto, into one sort of neat box that is inevitably going to leave 
certain people or, or certain concerns um, out of the conversation. You know, we are a very complicated community because of how diverse we are. And it's uh, it's just it's always fascinating to me. And I, and, I, and I try to remind myself of that when I hear Latinos with very different um viewpoints than i than i have i think to me the one unifying thing should be the just blatant racism against brown people that we've seen from this presidential candidate donald trump and how it trickles down and how the rhetoric affects the everyday lives of people like you and i walking around and 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 living on a daily basis and, and we've seen hate crimes we've seen mass shootings uh where they've targeted latinos you know and there's an interesting book that i just started reading from uh paula ramos who is a a journalist and she just put out a book called defectors the rise of the latino far right and what it means for america and uh she had i think her other book i, I think off the top of my head i believe was called defining latinx i had started to read that one as well um i've been following her for a minute i think she she does really interesting work. I, I think I first discovered her doing stuff for Vice, uh, and now she's on MSNBC a lot as a contributor. But this is a really interesting book that does a great job of sort of breaking down in, in her mind from her research basically three main things that she can consistently point to as to why Latinos have – some Latinos have moved towards the far right, and we're talking about, you know – sort of more extreme ideas, the uh, MAGAism and all these different things. Uh, I, I wanted to have her on the show. I got I to gotta send that email and hopefully we can make it happen. Um, I'm putting it out there to keep, hold myself accountable because I've been slacking on that a little bit. But she basically breaks it down. She says there are three main reasons, in, in her opinion, from her research, that Latinos are shifting towards the Republican Party. One being tribalism, one being traditionalism, and one being trauma. I'm going to break down quickly these three different things. I think they're interesting points of conversation. And I think as you hear them, many of us can probably begin to think of people in our lives that check one of these boxes, right, um, as to where they probably began to be a bit radicalized towards the far right movement. But first one she mentions is uh, traditionalism. And she refers to uh, the adherence to longstanding cultural and patriarchal norms, particularly around gender roles and family values that resonate with many Latinos. These norms are deeply ingrained and often connected to religious beliefs and colonial legacies. Ramos argues that this traditionalism can make Latinos more receptive to conservative rhetoric, especially on issues like gender, sexuality, and family dynamics, which align with their sense of cultural identity and stability amidst societal changes. Now, I think this is probably... The easiest one, or maybe the most spoken about one, I've met, I've mentioned this before, you know, and this is kind of a lot of the answer that I'll give if I'm speaking to people in normal life about this topic of conversation. Like, why are we seeing a lot of Latinos who are, are who lean right? And it is often in the way that we've been brought up. You know, many households are a bit more conservative um, in 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 you know Latino households and the background of religion. Right. Many of us grew up in religious households in some sort of way. And I think because of that and a bit of the bubble that a lot of that creates and, and um, you know, things like the machismo culture and and again, um, I don't know, I, I think that, and even what they mentioned about, the uh, you know, colonialism and the effects it's had. Right. The idea of like almost trying to not be seen or heard but just like you know get by almost right that that's like pre-programmed in us to be a good immigrant almost right and um you know i've told stories before about even in my own family dynamics i wasn't allowed to get certain haircuts because that's what like puerto ricans in the bronx you know like i think it was like a it was like a skin fade with a caesar and like the the front lined up you know real tight real sharp um, and I wasn't allowed to get that because my mom didn't want me to look like a Puerto Rican from the Bronx in my suburban high school. You know, a lot of that is rooted in fear of, of not wanting, you know, your children to be judged or treated differently. Right. And that is the effects of white supremacy and colonialism. Right. The idea of what is considered to be respectable, something as silly as a 
haircut like that because it has cultural ties automatically might put your child at a disadvantage and you have to compensate for that. Right. And then there's a fine line of, you know, wanting to put your, your child in the best place uh, as far as potential for their, their future. But at what costs, right. Are you, when you, when you begin to sacrifice cultural norms or their authenticity at what cost is that, I don't know that, that strategy coming at, right. And I think this speaks to that a bit as well. And, and even we talk about machismo culture and things like gender roles when it comes to tradition, right? I can, you know, remember a lot of stories I've heard people on this show, people I've talked to in my personal life, women, where, you know, they were impressed upon from a young age, always be wearing makeup, you know, um, always be acting in a way that would attract a husband, essentially, right? Like, how are you going to attract a husband if you don't have makeup on, if you're not dressed properly when you leave the house, if you curse, you know, that's not, you know, these are things that men don't, don't like, you need to learn how to cook because your your husband's going to want that. And it's this gender uh, role, this idea that a woman is meant to be, um, or her ideal goal needs to be um, being essentially the picture perfect wife, right? And, and in a modern society, that doesn't align right and and nor should it where women are stepping into their power and unapologetically taking up space as they should and even just from a practical sense economically unless you are incredibly well off most of us are going to have to live in a household and raise our kids in a household or we're raised in a household where both parents had to work in order for us to be able to lead a, a, a you know a comfortable life of some sort and that is the norm. And I just psychologically, women have dreams as well. And the idea that they have to suppress them for a man is archaic. But there are a lot of people who were brought up in that and fall into these old roles and are threatened by this sort of progress and the idea of progression. And the Democrats and the left, you know, with the words progressive being thrown around, represent a lot of that change. And Obviously, for them who are stuck in their old ways and for these men who be still believe that this sort of toxic machismo mindset is the only way to live, they're far more aligned with a conservative rhetoric that wants to tell women what they can and can't do with their body. And people like J.D. Vance calling women without children, you know, um, you know, sad cat ladies or, or whatever it is. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but you know, all of that falls in line with the old school, toxic, masculine, uh, machismo culture of, of many Latinos. To, to Palaramas's point here, that is um, why, you know, some of them fall under that traditionalism umbrella as to why they are leaning uh, towards this far right and then finding, you know, footing there. And also, I mean, in that same vein, their homophobia that has run rampant in our community for generations you know, the idea that we're trying to give people of the LGBTQ plus community more rights and allow them to live their lives as they see fit and allow them to live lives where they no longer feel like they have to live in hiding for fear of their own safety, but they can love who they want and live openly just like anybody else. Um, you know, again, that old school mentality is pushing back against that. And because the Democrats um, as a whole or as a party or, or as a, a standard or an ideal are the party that leans more towards inclusion. Again, those who have this old school traditionalist mindset of homophobia and toxic masculinity are going to run to the party that is still adhering to that. And, and it's psychology at the end of the day, right? It's like we're all built and programmed to want to exist within our comfort zones, you know, and even though those of us who continue to work on ourselves and push for bigger and better things understand that the life that we want is on the other side of our comfort zone. Most people, unfortunately, fall victim to wanting to just be within what's comfortable rather than what would actually make them better or make society as a whole better. And, and that's sort of one of the arguments she makes there. Now, the other one she makes is tribalism, referring to the idea that some Latinos align politically based on a sense of identity or belonging to a particular group rather than an ideology or policy. This can lead to support for the Republican Party because it appeals to a narrative of cultural or racial superiority, especially for those Latinos who may internalize anti-blackness 
or seek to distance themselves from marginalized groups. Tribalism fosters division and can be leveraged by political actors to exploit racial grievances and fears. And this is, is really interesting to me because, yeah, one of the other generational issues that we have dealt with within the Latin community is anti-blackness. You know, um, we've we've seen racism, internalized racism within our own community, the de denial of of African roots, um, you know, it, it is is so common of a particular generation. And. A lot of the far right rhetoric is rooted in white supremacy, and I think that's sort of an easy easy sort of one to pick up on as well. I think this sort of second part to this that I found to be interesting, particularly the idea of tribalism, it is the idea of wanting to distance yourself from being in a marginalized group, right? Wanting to be a part of the race or group that is viewed as superior, right? And I think that is is interesting in the book um they 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 mention a couple they mention like a meme that I think it rung really true to my own experience right and it uh it it mentioned this idea and I'm paraphrasing but it was like basically Latinos in the US uh traditionally have had to basically pick one course of action one route right either you assimilate into whiteness or you assimilate into black culture and obviously, I think geographics plays a, a role. Um, you know, cultural things, uh, the your the way you present plays a role. But it is a common narrative that a lot of Latinos, I think myself subconsciously, stepped into. And it is an interesting conversation, right? Because you know, from my own personal experience. I talk a lot about otherness, obviously, but I was, I'd say particularly high school uh, and, and early 20s, I was particularly leaning into a, a white crowd, like my immediate friends, with the exception of a, of a few, um, you know, many of whom were, were white. I wasn't going to like, you know, Latin parties or, or um, at that point in my life, I wasn't going to like hip hop parties. I wasn't playing in a band. So I was in, you know, those types of spaces. And then I began DJing like more electronic music initially. So, you know, those were primarily white spaces. And even though there was this idea of me being other in terms of that group, it was always the idea of like, oh, but he's one of the good ones. And there was like this sense of pride. I think, and and I would never, I was never conservative, but I can relate to it in that that degree of like, it's almost like you're chosen, right? That you're like it being accepted into this uh, superior group, almost, right? And I think for me, it was less about racism or or less about that, you know, oh, I was being accepted into white America. It was I was being accepted into what was the societal norm of good, right? These were guys that you know, uh, were seemed to have money and access and, you know, girls liked the, at the clubs we went to and drove nice cars and, and, and these different things. And it felt like, you know, you know, you're a part of sort of this privileged group almost. Right. And then as a DJ playing in those spaces, you know, not having to wait in line at clubs, getting, you know, the bartenders knew me and, playing these these big clubs and, and everything that comes along with it, it was it was like this acceptance into a place of privilege, right? And especially at that time, a lot of those clubs, even just as a musician, as a DJ, they didn't want you playing quote unquote ethnic music, urban music, whatever. Like, you know, it was like don't play a lot of hip hop, don't play a lot of Latin. Like that's not the type of crowd we want in here. And, you know, me at, at the point I'm at right now, um far more comfortable in my own skin to be like, fuck this place. It's not the kind of spot I want to play at that would, would ever tell me that. Um, and I've had plenty of uh, blowouts with people or, you know, stern conversations since then, or, you know, given up a lot of money because I'm not going to play places that even have that mindset. But at the time, you know, coming up, 
you you're you're it feels like you kind of have your hands behind your back and you're just trying to make a name for yourself or or meet people and get connected um but again that all like to bring it full circle that all creates this narrative of superiority right the quote-unquote hip-hop latin crowd that they viewed as quote-unquote ghetto was viewed as lesser than those clubs those places because oftentimes they were in the hood because those only places that would allow you to play that kind of music you know the entire night it was like viewed as a lesser than place to play as a dj or a lesser than social circle to be a part of and the elite social circle was the one that had you know in excess of white people and it was white culture essentially and um you know, it's just it's fascinating because it, it, I don't think you're conscious of it from a, a racial thing for the most part. And and quite honestly, I don't think, you know, all those people I knew were racist. I know they weren't, you know, but but there were racial undertones and subconscious thoughts and ideals. You know, some of them were blatantly racist, but, you know, um, that I've, I've come into contact with and, and you know, um, stayed clear of. But. You know, I think there are a lot of people who have a lot of blind spots because whiteness has been the standard, you know, and white supremacy has been the standard, right? The superiority of white culture. So for this, what they talk about, the idea of tribalism, I know I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but with tribalism, it's the idea of like, do I want to be one of the groups that is collectively by society looked down upon in this country? Or do I want to be a part of one of the groups that is looked at as the elite having the best lives, you know, participating in the best parts of this country. And I think a lot of, whether it's conscious, subconscious, a lot of Latinos will say, hey, if I can assimilate, right, especially those who have my complexion, why wouldn't I, right? I'm going to go and, and live out in this area where even though it means sort of forsaking my, my culture, I'm going to go and to this place where I'm getting more, you know, mainstream societal acceptance than I would if I was identifying more with my Latin culture, right? And I think that is, she brings up, there's a lot of great sort of case studies she has in there, um, but, you know, it's this idea of acceptance. And then, of course, those on the right who are white people, you know, will be like, see, I'm not a racist. We got our friend Miguel here, and I have no problem with him because he's one of the, because he actually gets it, right? He's one of the good ones. He's he's not trying to play a victim, right? And that's the narrative they push, like, oh, you're trying to play a victim if you're calling out the differences or the problems or the issues that we face as, you know, people of color rather than white people. Um, and that is their that is their defense mechanism to not have to admit that they have set, set up a, a system, you know, historically in this country that has skewed in favor of white people and made it more difficult for people of color. Right. But they'll claim that we're just making everything about race um, and, and ignore the fact that this country was founded and built. And, you know, the the pillars and foundation holding it up were, are built upon the idea of white supremacy, essentially. But we're the crazy ones because we keep bringing it up, quote unquote. Right. So, again, to not want to fall into one of those groups that is looked down upon many um Latinos who can are going to go the route of assimilating into whiteness because it feel like it gives them the best chance at leading a higher quality of life. And as a result, being the product of the five people you spend the most time around, if all of your friends are hardcore Republicans and all these things, of course, you're going to go along with it to continue on the illusion of living this superior life, you know, um, rather than being a part of a marginalized community. And the last one, because she mentions three, last one, she says trauma. And she refers to the personal and collective experiences of hardship or disillusionment that some Latinos face, which can make them more susceptible to far-right messaging. This trauma can stem from economic struggles, immigration challenges, or community violence leading individuals to seek stability and security in conservative ideologies that promise order and control. Politicians often exploit this trauma, framing issues like crime or immigration in ways that resonate emotionally, reinforcing fear and triggering a move towards the Republican Party. Now, this one is also interesting to me uh, because the, the Republican Party likes to position themselves as the party of law and order, essentially. Right. They're the ones that um, tell you to respect our troops, to, um, you know, uh, stand up and, and do the Pledge of Allegiance and, and you know, 
respect the flag and they're the ones flying the flags. They're the true patriots and they, they love police and, you know, blue lives matter and all these different things. They verbally position themselves as the party of law and order. And obviously we saw what happened on January 6th where all of a sudden it's okay to, uh, you know, violently attack um, police officers, go into a government building and, and you know, d uh, destroy it essentially and, and try and attack the, the very people um, that represent this country. That That's okay. But they position themselves as the party of law and order, right? And they do a great job of all the Democrats – they protest and they riot in the streets. They hate America. They're critiquing the government. They hate America. They're they're the ones causing all of these arguments that are happening, right? They're out there in the streets um, protesting. In their words, they would say rioting. They hate police. They hate the military. They hate this country. So they position the left as these sort of radical people who, uh, like, we want. they wanted to fund the police completely. They All these different things. And if you have been through trauma in your life, like many immigrants have, Latinos have, you know, the idea of if you grew up in a country where there was a lot of political violence or a lot of just violence in general, be it cartels, be it robberies, be it whatever, you know, police, uh, um, you know, or, or po police and political uh, corruption, you know, you fear growing up in an environment and rightfully so to a degree, you fear growing up in an environment that has any sort of political upheaval, right? You you view a protest um, or a critique of the police as, as a disturbance of the peace almost, right? And because the Republicans have done this great job of, of creating this propaganda narrative around the idea that they're the party of law and order for – Immigrants who are traumatized by all that they saw in their home countries, all that it took for them to get here. Many of the people crossing the border experiencing just extreme forms of violence uh, and, and their countries being incredibly violent and corrupt and, and all the different things that come along with that. Sadly, um, you know, which is why, why many people have, have fled. You want to, you know, live in the complete opposite of that and and anything that. Um, you know, and, and you become a target for people playing on that sort of trauma, gaslighting you essentially, right? To use a, a trending term, if you will. And, you know, it's the same thing in like in relationships or, 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 you know, manipulation in, in negotiations or corporate things or whatever. Like if you're aware of the other person's weakness, where they struggle, their insecurities, whatever it might be, if you are a certain kind of person, you can play into that. You know what buttons to push, right? And one of the greatest motivators for people, unfortunately, is fear. So if you make them fear change and you tell them that this party is going to uproot the very things that made the United States feel like a safe place for you to go and restart your life, and and that if they are in power, they are going to turn the United States into exactly what you fled from, yeah, of course, you're going to strike fear in in their hearts, in the hearts of people who have gone through so much shit, you know, be it personally or their family's own stories. And as a result, you know, again, in an era where we don't do a deep level of fact checking or really craft our own opinions or even really have the time to do, you know, our real due diligence, uh, you're, you're going to kind of fall susceptible to certain messaging when they when they touch that nerve intentionally. So I don't know. Just some food for thought that I found to be really interesting. I'm still in the process of reading the book. I think it's really fascinating. She interviews a lot of different people, um, obviously, who have been radicalized and, and and getting their sort of firsthand accounts and messaging and, and her kind of breaking it down. So I recommend you checking out the book. Again, I'm going to try to have her on the show at some point. Uh, but the book is called Defectors. I thought it was a really fascinating, interesting conversation around the, the Latin vote, if you will. With that said, we'll take a quick break here, and then we'll be right back. All right, we are back, and I wanted to quickly touch on uh, some news out of Puerto Rico. So I've been talking about this a lot on the podcast. It's been global news, Puerto Rico's power grid, um, the issues they're having on the island with keeping the lights on, essentially, has been an issue for a, a while now, only made worse after Hurricane Maria. And the idea of, like, rolling blackouts, regular back blackouts happening on the island are, unfortunately, a very common occurrence, and and – not only makes it difficult, but for certain people, makes it dangerous, you know, um, depending on if you have 
medical equipment that relies on on power and all these things and, and people are having to you know go out and, and buy things like generators you know it's becoming the norm and there's a big argument about what is the long-term solution here and one of the arguments or pushes that have been happening is the idea of solar and the question is basically is solar the long-term solution to puerto rico's energy crisis so with that in mind you had the u.s department of energy announcing that they were going to build two solar photovoltaic farms in puerto rico uh, as these persistent power outages plague the united states territory of puerto rico and i'm uh reading from ap news an article that they had, had published there now the project is going to be located in the southern coastal towns of uh, guayama and salinas and backed by Clean Flexible Energy LLC, which is a subsidiary of the AES Corporation and Total Energies Holdings USA, so American companies. Uh, they're saying that it would add up to 200 megawatts of solar generation and another 285 megawatts of storage capacity to Puerto Rico's grid, according to U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer M. Granholm. The solar photo voltaic project is expected to generate about 460,000 megawatts of energy enough to power some 43,000 homes officials say so this could be the future for for puerto rico and even with that like i mean it's close to a billion dollars that's a lot of money um this this sort of loan it's it's expensive and you know i think it, this is a this is a start, right? Now, unfortunately, it's a loan, and unfortunately, the companies coming in are U.S. companies, right? So it's 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 benefiting these external companies, which again, I don't. I know that there's a lot of back and forth about anything from the states and and how much the states profits off of the island of Puerto Rico and and things of that nature. And I don't argue against that, but you know the idea of foreign countries sort of setting up shop with their expertise in other countries isn't unheard of. Um, you know, either there there are, are a lot of countries who are doing business in Mexico and it's a mutually beneficial relationship and um, you know. Other parts of of I think Venezuela has a um, a partnership where where Colombia the like the sports goods brand opened up a factory out there um, so they would manufacture their clothing and, and Colombia actually funded the building of that factory so and it's a win win for all of them um, you know creates new jobs while while Colombia has a a maybe cheaper overhead as far as the production of the the clothing goes but yeah I, I think. Um, you know, I, I'd have to look a little bit more into the idea of it being a loan guarantee and, and what that exactly would mean uh, for the island of Puerto Rico, which is already, you know, in so much debt. But I think this is a move in the right direction. And I think for me, what I would like to see is why is this idea not a project that is more commonly being talked about? pitched created by the actual government of puerto rico why is the government of puerto rico not trying to find creative and innovative solutions for this very obvious problem and you know that's where i think the big question mark comes into into play is how motivated is the local government of puerto rico to actually find a new solution right or as many suspect fear there is some backdoor dealings with with luma and you know somebody might be getting a a kickback um from from luma being being there and I, there's also been alleged reports of you know a pushback against solar um because of the the interest um you know from from the corporation that actually gives gas to Puerto Rico, right? And they're the ones, you know, in, in charge of the energy for Puerto Rico along with, with Luma. Uh, I think it's Henera, I believe, is the, 
the the one that uh is yeah Haneda is the one that gives gas to to Puerto Rico um and the idea that this is the conflict of interest here right and I'm happy to see that there's this this push of, of, of solar here but what has sort of taken so long and why isn't this a far more expansive idea rather than just two farms here right because it's only this is only powering up uh, as they said here in in the article about 43,000 homes which is great but obviously they need more than that if this is going to be a sustainable long-term solution but much of of what i've sort of been seeing online a, a counter argument is there's a conflict of interest because you have a company like Haneda who has been uh, awarded the contract to manage the energy solution for Puerto Rico, but they are also the ones providing the gas. So if you are providing the gas for the island of Puerto Rico, what incentive do you have to move away from gas-generated electricity and move into solar? You don't. If you actually invested all your time and energy into developing these solar projects, it would be better for the island of Puerto Rico who you are in charge of, of managing their electricity. But for you as a company, it actually would take money out of your pocket because there'd be less of a reliance on gasoline. And that is the sort of predicament that the Puerto Rican government has gotten themselves in, whether it's corruption, whether it is just being complete and utter morons. Listen, I, I'd have to see the paper trail to see which one of those two it is. But to me, that is the bigger frustration and I think the bigger sort of uh, anchor holding Puerto Rico back from completely moving all in on, on something like solar. I mean, obviously, money is, is a part of that equation as well. You need a lot of money. I mean, almost a billion dollars in this small project. You need far more than that. Um, but, you know, it can't help that the people put in charge of managing the, the electricity are a company that also makes their money off of providing gas. And it seems like solar might be the best solution, but that would take money out of their pockets. So why would they do that? That's literally like a textbook definition of a conflict of interest. But once again, normal life in Puerto Rico, apparently, and unfortunately, at the expense of the everyday person living on the island. Just some thoughts, though. With that said, um, We'll, we'll move into a more positive thing. We're going to celebrate a, a company started by Latinos who just had a big, big, big exit uh, and and now have created a substantial amount of generational wealth for themselves. So we will talk about that in our Mi Gente segment. Mi Gente. All right, so this last thing I want to talk about, again, I, it's like I've seen – Mixed reviews online. I'm getting this from WeAreMeToo.com, and they're going to reference it in in the back and forth con uh, conversation. But this story, I think it's a positive, personally. Spoiler alert. But uh, this is uh, Siete Foods, and they're the ones – they are a, a Mexican-American-founded um, company. You've probably seen their snacks. They do like these um, – Oh, they do the what the hell are they called? They're not. It's not. It's not called Christmas cookies. They're like these sugar cookies that are delicious. It comes in a blue package. Um, with the it's Mexican. They're called Mexican. Damn it! Uh, it's like on the tip of my tongue. I can't remember the name of it, but they're fucking amazing. They also do these like churro chips. Uh, I'm, I'm calling them churro. I, they might be called churro. It's like cinnamon. It's just delicious. This it's delicious and it's supposed to be healthier. I think Whole Foods has them, but I've seen them at like Target and stuff as well. Um, but Pepsi actually just acquired Siete Foods in a $1.2 billion deal. Now, the family-run brand, again, was founded by third-generation Mexican-American Veronica Garza in Laredo, Texas. Uh, after being diagnosed with lupus, Garza recognized the need for grain-free tortillas for people with specific conditions like herself. She said, you would think our community would celebrate one of our own making big hefa moves, right? And this is a We Are Me Too article saying this. Those aren't my words. Yet when the news broke, some concerns of the internet and many Latino online communities were not having any of it. The comments showed that many of their original customers were clearly angry by the decision. And I'm going to put on my empathy cap here. Empathy cap is coming on. I do get it. From, from that perspective, right? Because you had a company 
that is based around cultural identity, right? Because if you look at the, from the packaging to the products they offer, very much so rooted in Mexican culture. And then also has this sort of greater mission of providing grain-free products for people who are of the community and have specific medical conditions. But like any of us don't want to give up the the, the comforts of, of their culture. And food is a big part for, for many of us, obviously. So I think if you had you have this personal attachment to a brand like this and you're so proud to buy it and support it because of the story, you know, and 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 the people behind it and the message behind it, the messaging in general. Yeah, it does feel a bit cheapened now that a brand like Pepsi who doesn't have the emotional or cultural tie to it is going to be the one running the show and it then brings up a lot of concerns. I saw this further in the article, which I'll, I'll link in the show notes if you want to read the full thing. But it does bring up the concerns of, does the quality stay the same? Does the mission stay the same, right? And all of that, I think, is very relevant. I think from the perspective that you have to see it from, you have to look at it from an entrepreneurial expe- uh, perspective. And this is where the this is where the line, by the way, is, is really blurry, really really difficult, even for somebody like myself, right? And I hear it from both sides, and I I find myself often landing in the middle, right? As I begin to scale up and like you know create product products and do these different things and like want to better myself and and set my family up for a future, I do fall victim to a little bit of guilt, like how can I? do this without exploiting my people and everything feels like exploiting you know and and like me you know with the just be stuff it's like i feel bad that i can't just give away this these shirts and things like that for free right that i'm like charging you know and and i have to do that and like i feel bad about that but it's like you you have to find that balance where it's also hey this is a business at the end of the day this is fun for me because i enjoy it but it's work and and it's it's a goal of mine for this to be a bigger part of my life or for me to use my talents, skill set, and passion as a means to set my family up generationally. And the goal of, of every business, every entrepreneur for the most part, let's take culture completely out of it, most businesses, the goal is to grow it, scale it, and then get it to a point where it's so big that it gets acquired for a large sum of money and you can set yourself up and set your family up for generations where money is no longer a concern and that you can then move on to the next creative endeavor right because i'm sure these the, you know this this founder veronica has other creative things that she wants to do i'm sure this won't be the last company she starts but this is the goal. This is literally, I think, if you were to ask any business person, again, let's take culture out of it because this is traditionally white spaces as far as like these types of deals. This is a success story. This was the goal from you know day one. Aside from starting a company, it's like, okay, at one point, I'm going to exit when the time is right. That's a celebration point. Everybody has pretty much done it, you know? And the idea is not to be working yourself to the bone your entire life on your business. The idea is to grow it to a point where you no longer have to work and you can move on from it. And I get, again, the this is a little bit more complicated because there are cult- cultural ties to it. There are you know community aspects to it where you represent a community, also where you are creating a product that is delivering a healthier option for the community. But you, this is a moment of celebration. I think we have to understand that this is bigger than just our favorite brand, you know? And again, I think the fears are maybe relevant, but you have to understand, like, this is a very rare success story for somebody of the community. And while for us, you know, the idea of change, it might feel uncomfortable, you have to understand, like, they are now in a very rare air of... Lat- not only Latinos, but entrepreneurs in general. And we have to celebrate that, you know? And and, and we are, I mean, too, they, they did sort of bring up that counter argument, which I want to read kind of the, the, the gist of what they said. They, they talk about how Latino founders who raised funds in 2021 made up only 2% 
of all venture investments. And there's been uh, a 70% year over year decline in funding towards Hispanic brands. We're going the wrong direction as far as funding goes. And anybody, you know, not super familiar with the idea of, uh, of entrepreneur or scaling or venture capitalism, all these things, all these brands that you see today, Amazon, Uber, uh, whatever it might be, at some point in time, it's like Shark Tank, the TV show Shark Tank, you get to a point where you can no longer fund it yourself and you need to bring in outside investment if you want to grow the company and and provide a better service, a bigger service or whatever it might be. And that is an essential part of turning an idea into something like Uber or Amazon, right? And the statistics show that unfortunately for Latino entrepreneurs, these opportunities are few and far in between. So the idea of, of, of a company like Siete getting this billion dollar buyout, again, is a moment of celebration because they represent a very small percentage of Latino entrepreneurs who have gotten the opportunity to scale their business to the degree that it deserves. And hopefully, you know, they then use this as an opportunity to do the same for others. That's what would be my goal. But, you know, that, that's, I think, why we have to realize this is also a moment of celebration. Um, in the further in the article, they say, we're faced with a ghastly racial family wealth gap, which also means that many of our founders don't have the, quote, friends and family round that many non-Hispanic white founders have. Friends and family rounds are the initial stages of a company where founders raise capital from people within their network. So essentially, for most startups, before you end up in, like, the idea of outside investment from, like, venture capital firms, most people will pitch their friends or family around them and say, hey, I've got this business. If you are able to give me whatever you could give me, I'll give you a percentage of of, of the company. Um, but this is like that, or you take a loan from your parents or whatever it might be. I don't know about y'all, but like for the most part, my parents didn't have a few extra thousand dollars lying around to help me get my businesses off of of the ground. I can remember my mom helped me with my first LLC. I think it cost $300 at the time to do, or $250, $300. And that seemed like the biggest deal in the entire world. I believe we went to dinner to celebrate, right? So that was like the what she was, and, that, and that's probably more than other people's mom or dad would have been able to give them. But for me at the time, that was a huge deal. And that's what they were able to do for me. So to their point, many of us don't have that network of, of wealthy individuals in our lives that we can lean on and say, hey, give me a loan or invest in my company like a lot of white entrepreneurs do. And they go on to say, as a result, founders are at a disadvantage from the day they launch and have to work extra hard to find funding for the business, often in the form of taking grants, loans, or getting into credit card debt. Venture capitalist firms and angel networks like Latitude Ventures, Angelus Ventures, Chingona Ventures, and networks like Pipeline Angelus that create a new Latina angel investors are moving that needle. So these are these are... Latin ones, so uh, Latitude Ventures, Angeles Ventures, Chingona Ventures, uh, Pipeline Angeles, um, they are Latine angel investors. And the only way you get Latin angel investors is by people uh, like like Siete, like that company being bought out. Now this founder has a ton of money that they can use to invest in other Latin ventures, but somebody has to start it, right? Um, but as they say, there's so much to be done. And what they end with is what Siete Foods did went against the odds. It was an impressive and likely unprecedented move. They are now among North America's most successful Latino food entrepreneurs. So amazing. So we're going to do a little golf clap right here. That's why it's a positive. I understand the short term, it feels uncomfortable for many people, especially if you're like an avid buyer of this product, of this company. And, and selfishly, you want the brand to stay exactly the same. But this is how we progress as a community and how we can collectively put ourselves in better positions in order to bring up the rest of our, our, our Latinidad, our community, right? The idea of, you know, uh, what is it, rising tides lift boats, right? Throwing the ladder back down. You now have, obviously, she's not getting the entire $1.2 billion, but she's getting a healthy chunk of it, I'd assume. You have somebody like Veronica Garza, who now potentially could be in a position to invest and help fund 
many other Latinos dreams uh, of, of having their business, you know, be successful. So this is in my book, a, a positive, I understand some of the optics and, and how it might feel uncomfortable. Again, if you are a big fan of the brand, but we have to look at the big picture here and, and it's a win at the end of the day. So big congratulations to, to her and, and her whole family and the whole Siete team. Um, really amazing stuff. And, and I've enjoyed their product over the years. So really cool stuff. With that said, let's tie up that we talked about today in a neat little bow in a segment called Conclusion Stew. Time for Conclusion Stew. Mm. I don't know if I've been yelling a lot today, but my voice is like going. It hurts. Like, you know what it is? Side, in a side note here, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. But I was listening to this podcast, and um, I always forget the guy's fucking name. But... He was just basically talking about like you gotta you have to your entire life has to be in a, in a you have to try to get it in a way of flow, a flow of you know cons- especially if you're like trying to create stuff if you're creative you're an entrepreneur you're trying to bring ideas to life you have to constantly have all you know the areas of your life in flow the idea of like your life is in flow where you're constantly meeting new people you're constantly having new experiences you're constantly having new opportunities for wealth creation or partnership or networking whatever it might be you want to create a lifestyle that allows you to constantly be in flow of meeting potential partners, be it friendship or if you're looking romantically or uh, business-wise, whatever it is you're looking for, you have to do the activities that put you in that position to be in the orbit of those kinds of people. So I've been trying to do that. Like this week especially, it just so happened everything compounded into like one week. I think this is uh, every day with the exception of, of yesterday – I cuz yesterday I had to um yesterday I had babysit my my niece and nephew um which is awesome but um other than that I've been out and about and I've been like in loud environments just screaming over music basically so I think my throat is just fucked after this week and now the, the podcast has finally driven that home um as I've passionately been yelling about these last few topics anyway that was just a, a personal antidote I wanted to get out there with that said all we've been talking about today uh the latino vote it's complicated, man. And it we don't exist in a monolith. We have a, a, a variety of different opinions. Obviously, I, I think this book from Paolo Ramos Defectors uh, it, it shines a light on a, a really interesting phenomenon happening within the Latin community. I think it's great that something like Kamala Harris, uh, you know, had a, a town hall with Univision to try to speak to Latino voters. You know, it, it, we're just a very diverse and complicated demographic. And I think um, while there's no easy solution, we probably would never, you know, I don't, you no, know, I don't think any group you're going to get to a complete solution where everybody is happy and everybody's needs are met, uh, or everybody feels seen. But I, I do think we we could get to a place where I think collectively there's a bit more understanding of the diversity of the Latin community. Um, and, and that, I think that comes with advisors and, and things of that nature. And, and hopefully this town hall that Kamala Harris did with, uh, the Latin community. And then the one she did with, uh, show me the God that was, was targeting the black community. These are hopefully just like, you know, um, implications of what we can expect for a Kamala Harris, uh, presidency of, of hopefully making it a point to surround herself with people who, uh, are in touch with the needs of, of the various communities within this country so she can do her best to address them. Um, and that's the, the hope. Um, and when it comes to, to Puerto Rico, you know, I want to see more ideas and, and more conversation on this idea of solar. I, I don't have anything to summarize, but I think I was just sort of stating an update of what was happening there. But um, just I think we need a lot of change. There needs to be far more innovative speakers, um, innovative people in positions of power on the island. I think this obsession with statehood versus independence is really taking away from the conversations that need to happen if we want to improve the lives of people on the island of Puerto Rico. If we, if we want to address the issues that are affecting them on a daily basis, we can't sit here and focus all our time and energy on the statehood versus independence argument. I'm not saying that it's not an important topic of conversation, but there are so many 
issues that need to be addressed that are affecting people every second of every day on the island. And there aren't enough progressive ideas and solutions uh, being created by the local government um, and, and, and being pitched, I think, or talked about by, by people as a whole. There aren't enough of those conversations happening to really address the quality of life um, of the people of Puerto Rico. And I think that's where the focus really, really needs to be. Again, I think statehood versus independence is an important topic of conversation, but let's sort of figure out the things that are really affecting the people right now. Um, you know, a, a and, and that starts in let's the most basic of things, figuring out a way for them to get electricity that they can count on on a daily basis. And rather than bringing in these temporary Band-Aid solutions and companies that are just there to make a quick and easy buck and get out as soon as they can, what is the long-term play, the long-term solution that we can begin to ponder, implement? And if it's solar, how do we go all in on that to actually create a, a future we can count on in Puerto Rico? And I think that's what needs to be um, the primary focus of those in power, those who have a platform, those who have a voice. It's like focus on those key issues that are really affecting people on a day-to-day -day basis. And then from there, we can blanket out into some of the more existential crises that affect us uh, on a regular basis. And again, I know the colonial status does have an effect on so many things um, happening on the island and, and so many of the things that, you know, um, affect it on a day-to-day -day basis. But even with that said, I don't hear enough topics of conversation I don't hear enough progressive and innovative ideas um, coming from those in power, and that might scare me more than anything. So that's just my my food for thought as a, a New Yorican. Take it for what it is. And then, man, this whole thing with um, Siete Foods uh, being acquired by Pepsi, $1.2 billion, a billy. Congratulations. That is a... a company founded by third generation Mexican American Veronica Garza wanted to provide a healthier alternative for people like herself who had specific medical conditions and couldn't handle grains. Amazing. And while maybe, you know, some people might feel like they're losing their favorite food brand. Hopefully you just gained an ally in someone of the community who is going to then empower the next, however many, let's 10 people to have, more generational ideas like this one that then can pass it down again. They empower another 10 and, that, and then it just becomes the norm that we are just an empowered community of entrepreneurs bringing our ideas to life. So that's why this is a win to me and it's a beautiful thing to see. With that said, thank you all so much for tuning in. I will catch you on Tuesday with a brand new episode. Till then, stay safe and we'll talk soon. Peace.